Welcome back and our first uh, conversation right here on The Breakfast and Plus TV Africa. Our concern is increasing that more Nigerians are going to get infected and many more may die uh, from the nationwide cholera outbreak, uh, which is fueled by flooding, fueled by terrorism-related activities, civil unrest, a lack of proper environmental sanitation, as well as shortage of vaccines. Now, the United Nations Children's Fund, UNICEF, at the weekend had raised the alarm that more than 2.5 million people in Nigeria are in need of humanitarian assistance, 60% uh, of whom are children. Now, and uh, that's very worrying. And uh, they are also said to be at increased risk of waterborne diseases, uh, drowning, and malnutrition due to the most severe flooding uh, that has engulfed Nigeria in the past decade. Now, the floods which have affected 34 out of Nigeria's 36 states uh, have displaced uh, an estimated 1.3 million people. Uh, over 600 people have lost their lives and over 200,000 houses have either been partially or fully damaged. Uh, this is reported, uh, it is reported that cases of diarrhea and waterborne diseases, respiratory infections and skin diseases have also been uh, on the rise. In the northeastern states of Nigeria, you have Bono State, Adamawa State, and Yobe State alone. A total of 7,485 cases of cholera and 319 associated deaths were reported as of October 12. Now, this is a worrying situation. Now, joining us to discuss this uh, cholera outbreak in Nigeria and the way forward is a public health expert, Dr. Tui uh, Mebawondu. Dr. Mabawondo, good morning to you and thank you very much for your time. Good morning. Thank you for having, having me. I hope you are enjoying the rain. We can hear you loud and clear. Uh, 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 cholera, this, this situation is really, really worrying. I mean, we're hearing uh, the National Center for Disease Control confirming 10,745 cases of cholera uh, with 256 deaths in 31 states. What is cholera? Yeah, thank you. Cholera is a disease caused by a bacteria we call Vibrio cholerae. What the bacteria does is to cause vomiting and stooling and rapid loss of water and nutrients from the body. Um, within a few periods, such a massive loss of food and what and, and nutrients from the body results in death. The fatality rate of cholera is very high, can be as high as 40 to 30 to 40 percent. So that what causes cholera? That's the action of the bacteria. How does the bacteria now get to human or human being? Uh, cholera is a disease of poverty. It's a disease of inequality. Um, it's a disease we see from instability and fragile states. It's a disease of malnutrition. It is of water, sanitation, and hygiene. Most of the time, cholera is taken from the feces or contaminated water sources into the mouth. And then within a few days, it then gives rise to the classical symptoms of vomiting and water too. All right, um, Dr. Chris. Dr. Tuyi, I beg your pardon. Uh, would you say that this uh, outbreak that we're experiencing now can be connected with the current flooding situation in Nigeria? Yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah. The, why we're having this outbreak now? Listen, cholera has been occurring in Nigeria recurrently. In early this year, we have cholera outbreak where quite a large number of people die. Now, the season of the flooding is worsening the case of cholera because there is massive destruction of water, sanitation, and hygiene. Particulate matters, species now contaminate surface water, and indeed, lots of water, none to drink. People have, have now been destabilized from their homes. They live more in the camp, and a lot of issues concerning sanitation and hygiene have been breached. If you look at how this flood is cut, in February, in Nigeria Meteorological Agency predicted 
in their senior climate prediction, we call it SCP, that we are going to experience floods in Nigeria. And they talk of clearly water levels, issues that they come up. But you know, like all of us, like most of we do in Nigeria, when we get information, we go to sleep. We don't act on it, on them. And then you consider the issue of climate change, you consider the issue of Anthropocene, human activities versus the climate. All this is combined with the sporadic heavy rainfall to give us all we are saying now. It's not that this thing will just happen. We have been warned as far back as even years, as far back as February, the Nigerian Meteorological Agency had told us that we are going to have excessive rain, we are going to have floods, they will tell fire. And if you look at the country where there are no water and sanitation infrastructure, where the health system is weak, of course, during the flooding, except cholera, except even more um, challenging waterborne diseases, typhoid, diarrhea, increasing malaria, and all that stuff. All right. Uh, um, uh, so you talked about the uh, NIMED predictions, and you're saying basically that uh, we had ample time to prepare uh, for this situation, but um, unfortunately we've not been able to uh, put in place mechanisms. Now, when such um, uh, warnings and alerts are issued by the uh, weather agency, meteorological services, um, what are the health services meant of government, health agencies, be the ministry or the, the uh, NCDC, the state governments and the, uh, um, the, the, the public health departments of the states, what are they meant to be doing immediately to get these predictions and uh, of high rainfall and possible flooding, flash flooding, etc. What should they um, be doing when they get these uh, these alerts and these reports, predictions? Yes, of course. So flooding or you know climate issues is not just limited to health alone. It's a multi-sectorial response. The, uh, the agriculture, mission of agriculture will be there, mission of environment, housing education, health, minimally, and any sort of information. These are really, uh, that's why I have to set up collaboration. In the sense that when flooding comes, it brings in a lot of challenges. Nutritional challenge, trade crops, um, houselessness or homelessness, increased disruption and location into IDP, disruption of education, Broken infrastructures like roads, electrical uh, supply, and all those things. So it's a, it's a multi dimensional, you know, multi sectorial collaboration that needs to deal with such challenge. Now, at the level of the health, we identify clearly how do you provide the water for these people should flood happen. So it means that we must have a means of supplying water to those people. Water that will be clean, that will be portable, that will not be injurious to their health. It means that you see, you have to step up primary health care services in the flood prone area in such a way that the doctors can respond to their health. Because don't forget, the nurses, pharmacists, doctors residing in those areas will also have their houses washed away. Flood will not distribute between them. So, how do you mobilize human resources? They respond in that situation. What, top, what, what, what sort of um, uh, things you have to buy? Equipment, drugs, disposable that you have to buy to respond at that point. What sort of health education or health literacy or campaign that you need to do to ensure that these people know what to do in this dire situation? These are collaborative efforts that involve everybody from agriculture, education, environment, infrastructure, health, all of them must work together. So the component of the health, for instance, look at it. You know that when there's flooding, there's going to be increased cholera. What you should do actually is to step up cholera vaccination. Now how can you step up cholera vaccination when all you just have in the world now is about 70 million doses of cholera vaccine? 
36 million. Out of this, Chevrolet has been shipped out before now. They deserve 8 million for emergency response. And we just have a 4 million left. And now we are looking at how to produce cholera vaccine. How, what then? What of typhoid vaccine? Because you can immunize people across line to prevent the, the health challenges that we may encounter during flooding and uh, when cholera comes calling. These are some of the things we need to do. What, what sort of care do you now provide for them when, they are, when the toilet has been washed away? These are issues that resides in the environmental um, uh, ministry, Ministry of the Environment and Water Resources. All right, Dr. Tui, uh, let's uh, still talk about what we can do as a people, as a government, and other stakeholders to stop the further spread or outbreak of cholera especially at this time where, I mean, we might just be going through a, nas uh, a national disaster? Well, I think the target point, the cheapest for us is to um, dispense copious information. Now, information in different languages we are talking about, in, in Yoruba language, in Pidgin English, in Igbo, in Alpha, in Ijo, localized to those areas. Then secondly, you can do a lot of pamphlets and banners telling them that you see, these are the early symptoms of cholera, these are the various sizes of cholera. You need to do that information, it's very, very key. Secondly, you need to secure alternative sources of water supply for your household. And hand washing, even during the flood, you have so wash your hand, wash your legs, and like those infections from skin infections to water contamination will be due. And you have to move away from the flood area because there are also diseases coming after the flood. There will be increased um, malaria because of the stagnation of the water and the breeding of disease vectors. You have to be careful in terms of uh, reptiles and animals that may even get the abode and enter human settlement. So for cholera, basically you need to do hygiene, secure water supply, sanitation, proper disposal of the waste. Those are just basic. But how about those who have been displaced? I mean, because it's encompassing. We're talking about uh, a lot of persons who have been displaced, especially with the current situation of flooding. And how can these persons act in this way? People have lost their houses. I, I, I didn't quite get your, your question. Okay, so I'm saying that the issue is encompassing. Now we have, you know, from your thoughts, uh, it feels like you're directing that to those who actually have houses and are living uh, comfortably. But what happens to those who have been displaced, especially by the current situation in the country? Indeed. We, we need to, you know, like I said, um, weeks back, that I was expecting the top people campaigning for election to spare thoughts and uh, mobilize support and resources to help those people. Um, there are multiple agencies, multiple agencies, it's not just about humanitarian uh, good or NEMA, um, the NGOs, the churches, religious institutions, you know, state government. Um, I had some countries donating money. Uh, for instance, America donated one million. We must be able to use this money um, effectively to respond to those people. Now, what we need to do first and foremost is to look for a high ground where these people can stay temporarily uh, before the water there is seen. Um, that is essential. Then, secondly, we have to provide materials for them, uh, including uh, beds, mosquito nets, food items, secure their nutrition, uh, provide something of a warmth for the extreme of ages, very young and very old. Those one we have to actually do for them. Then um, there, all the pathways blocking the flow of water we have to clear, and in case maybe uh, the earlier restoration 
of the of the water supply is key. Earlier installation of health institution is key. The integrated flood management is a multi-sectoral approach. Uh, health our component is there. I would want to realize the relevant agency to intervene. Now we are going to see destruction of the of the land farms at about eighty four thousand hectares of farm land that been destroyed so far. Um, there is situation for food supply, so government was actually move food in, distribute to the people or supply to them at a very very cheap rate, so they must be able to eat. And then they tell the the, the vulnerable and um, children, you know, like we are already we have twenty five million young minority children. And um, this one is going to work in malnutrition, and we must pay attention. Now this cholera, then in the next few months, we must pay attention to my to the increase things of malnutrition, even of malaria and typhoid that will be upcoming. So this is some of the things that we can do right now. All right, Doctor Tui Mewaondo. For those who are watching this morning, uh, who would like to know what they can do to protect themselves, their children. Uh, you have kids going to school. You know, you have. Um, uh, the, the, some schools are on midterm, so they'll be returning to school, I'm um, sure, sometime next week. Um, you have people who are in flood-affected areas but probably are able to still continue their lives. Uh, I don't know if this is a communicable disease, if it spreads from person to person. What can families do to protect themselves? What do they need to do? Um, let's put government aside for now to protect themselves. I think the first thing is life, uh, actually. So... Family was a uh, secured location. It could be with the help of state government, NGO, federal government, or even concerned individuals. Secure location for the family. That is the first thing. And the beauty is that in Africa, you still have this connection where I can I'm related to my family elsewhere temporarily. So they will seek that temporary location uh, where they can uh, stay, how to be. Um, uh, without the flood, or you know, the way we, or the flood water level. So, it's important, that's the first thing. But then, um, the next thing is that the family must embrace basic water sanitation and hygiene. They must embrace basic water sanitation and hygiene. That is very key. Um, secondly, um, I'm sure they can, the school can structure education for them. The plan will not last forever. It will be received after the cause of damages. I know they will not be able to salvage some of their, um, some of their, some of the problems they have, some of their valuable. But first and foremost, what family needs to do is secure their life, prevent the disease, Look up um, to restart their life with every help that they are doing. All right, all right. We'd like to say a very big thank you uh, to Dr. Tui Mebao, the public health expert, for your thoughts and analysis of the um, very worrying cholera outbreak situation in parts of Nigeria, exacerbated uh, by some factors, including the flooding that's ravaging 34 out of 36 states in the country. Really grateful for your time, sir. All right, and uh, of course we'll be back. Uh, we'll keep our eyes on this ball and on this situation, uh, monitoring what happens and uh, as it unfolds in the coming uh, days and weeks. It's really worrying, a worrying situation with the deaths being recorded. And uh, of course, uh, you have people dying uh, in these flood-affected areas, affecting water bodies, and you don't know who is going to want to do something with that water. Uh, maybe dead bodies, you know, will be found even after the water goes away. Um, a public health. Uh, agencies need to swing into action uh, in a bigger way to do something about this. We'll take a break and when we come back we talk finance. Uh, of course there's a new card, uh, finance card that is being introduced by the Central Bank of Nigeria. We have more discussions ahead on The Breakfast.